Thank you. Tonight, I'm more or less speechless. I had prepared a speech, but I think I'll have to change it and tell you the real life behind the movie Hotel Rwanda you have seen. But before telling you the real life behind the movie you have seen, I'll just give you a background of the Rwandan history so that you know who is who, who is a Hutu, who is a Tutsi, and so on. Rwanda is a landlocked country located in the center of Africa with three ethnic groups. Hutus, 85%, Tutsis, 14 and Batwa, just 1%. There is no Hutu land, no Tutsi land. There is no Hutu culture, no Tutsi culture. All Rwandese have got the same culture. Now, why do people hate each other? Because of bad leaders. Late 1800s, Rwanda, like any other African nation, was colonized. The first colonizers were Germans. When they came in, it was not easy to colonize such a linked nation. The only solution became to tell a small part of the population that look here, you guys, you are more clever, you are more intelligent, you are made to lead, whereas the others are made to respect. In 1918, a German lost World War I. When they lost, Rwanda was given to Belgium as a protectorate. Unfortunately, the Belgians did never change the German politics. That is why in 1935, when they made the first Rwandan identification cards, they even happened to, to mention the ethnicity. They wrote Hutu, Tutsi, Batwa. And whoever we were, they were always underlining the word Hutu, the word Tutsi, or the word Twa, to, to say to mean Batwa. By 1994, many political opposition, political parties came up, and the then president felt very much threatened. Being threatened, he also created a militia, and the militia started killing civilians again. You could hear in Kigali that people were gathered just like tonight and militia men came in with grenades and threw in grenades and killed hundreds of, hundreds of people and many others injured. You could hear that people were gathered in a bar drinking and militia men came in and threw in grenades and killed hundreds and many others were injured. You could hear that people in a bus station and militia men came in and threw in grenades and killed a lot of them. We, all of, the, all of us, became threatened. We, all of us, became scared. On August 4th, 1993, we saw a kind of small light, a small light of hope, a small candle in the wind, in the darkness, in the wind. A peace agreement was signed between the rebels the opposition and the then government to make people believe in that hope. The United Nations, for the first time, came in with other powers. But on April the 6th, in the evening, I remember I was at the, the, at the diplomat hotel at 8.30, two missiles happened to hit the presidential plane in which the Rwandan and Burundese president were, and both were killed. I used to stay not far from the airport. My wife, who was not with, that, with us, I was with my brother-in-law and his wife having dinner. And my wife, who had the missiles destroying the plane, phoned me and said that, please, rush and come back home. I have heard something I never heard before. Please 
do as fast as you can. Instead of her taking a car, rushing and coming to the hotel, she called me back home. I took a car. I went. But before going, I shaked my brother-in-law's hand and his wife's hands for the last time. That was the end of our meeting. We were separated. They went to their house. They were killed. They were never found. I tried to contact, to call my friends in the United Nations, the UN high-ranking leaders, soldiers, telling them that, please, help me. Come and escort me from my house to the hotel. They told me that, listen, Paul, militia men, soldiers, have set up roadblocks all over the city. We can't cross any. They are arresting people. They are asking, asking IEDs, killing some already. We cannot help you. The following morning, I saw many of my, my neighbors in military uniforms. I saw many of my neighbors in militia uniforms. Some of them with guns. I never knew that those guys were trained. Those guys were soldiers. I saw them. I was very much surprised to notice that. And those ones who were not in military uniforms were being hunted and others being killed. On April 9th, at midday, I saw that there were two jeeps, two military jeeps with the 20 soldiers. The captain, their leader, who seemed to be a very cool, generous, kind young man, came to me and told me that, listen, sir, are you the manager of the diplomat hotel? I said, yes. If you are the manager, the government, a new interim government, had just been put up. The government has sent us to pick you up and bring you to the hotel. I said, yes, this is a good idea. But I have my family. I can le not leave them behind. My family used to be made of six people. That time, we were 32. <laughs> he told me that, bring everybody. Take them. Which we did. Those kind soldiers, those soldiers who showed me that they were very kind a few minutes before became very aggressive than ever. The same captain came to me and pointed with a finger. He said, you traitor, you are lucky we are not killing you today. But have this gun. He handed me a Kratchenkov. Have this gun and kill all of your cockroaches in this car. I knew he was not joking. All along the street, there were dead bodies. I could see them. I knew he was not joking. I watched him speechless for five minutes. After five minutes, I told him that, listen, you guys, I do understand you. You are thirsty. You are hungry. You are tired. You are stressed by the war. I do understand you. I do get you 100%. But... Are you sure that your enemy you are fighting today is this old man? Are you sure that your enemy is this baby? There was a young lady who was holding her second baby. I pointed my finger to her. And then we opened a discussion and started dealing. On the screen, that deal took about a minute or a maximum of two. But in the real life, in the real life, it took two hours. After two hours of negotiations, they drove us to the diplomat hotel, and we stayed for three days. After three days, on April the 12th, very early in the morning, I woke up. Big, the manager, the Mikolin manager, had been evacuated on the 11th in the evening. And before being evacuated, he phoned me and told me that, Paul, can you please have a look at the Mikolin Hotel? I'm being evacuated. I said, yes, I will, but the government is here. Um, sometimes I might, some other times, no. So on 12th, very early in the morning, I just woke up at 7 and saw that the members of the government were already gathering things, Hot hotel bed sheets, blankets, pillows, and everything, putting in their cars. 
I saw, I saw that those guys were leaving. I just ran upstairs, told my wife and children that you guys get ready. We joined their convoy. They got ready. We joined the convoy. And when we arrived at the Mikulin Hotel, I turned left and went back to a hotel which I had left one and a half years before. When I arrived in the hotel, there was no security. There was no one. The militiamen had just set up a roadblock at the entrance of the hotel. The two things, the two barriers I had to remove were that to get, first of all, the protection. I took, for the, for the first time, my address book, started calling other people, other soldier lead, the, the gendarmes, high-ranking leaders, and the soldiers. At the end of the day, I had five gendarmes who came and protected the hotel and stayed there for the whole length of the genocide. At the end of the day, I got the roadblock removed. And by that time, that day, the very day, we had 400 refugees staying in the Nicolin Hotel. In the meantime, all the soldiers had been evacuated, all the UN soldiers, all the peacekeepers, without any witness. Rwandese, butchered Rwandese, without any international witness, and the whole world stood by and watched. On April 22nd, I had spent almost the whole day and night sending faxes, phoning, disturbing the whole world. Each and every day became almost like a year. Imagine a hotel without water, without electricity, without telephone, without food. And yet, you have more than a thousand people to feed. Sometimes I could go down by the swimming pool, sit around the swimming pool, watch the level of the water slowing down, going down each and every minute. Because I was rationing that water myself, we had no other hope than the swimming pool water. I could see the level going down, wondering what will we drink tomorrow? Shall we cook again? Where are we going to get firewood? Where are we going to get food? And things like that. On May the 2nd, the rebels, the army, the United Nations decided to evacuate the Mikorin refugees. Lists were made, and all the names of my family members came almost first. That day, many people came to me and, and told me that, listen, if you are being evacuated tomorrow, please let us know. There is no way we can accept to be killed with machetes. Let us know so that we can go even to the roof of the hotel and jump from there. To be killed was no more a problem. But how, where, when, those were the questions we were asking ourselves. That day, I had made a decision not to be evacuated. And if I'm evacuated and these people are killed, I will never in my life feel a free man. I will be a prisoner of my own conscience. I will never go to bed and sleep. I never eat and feel satisfied. So I better die than suffering, being tortured by my own conscience throughout my life. So I met one of the leaders, the then leaders, the mayor of Kigali, and told him that morning that, listen, Colonel, I need your help. I need soldiers to come and take care of these people because after killing the refugees in the same for me, militia men are coming to Alamir Colin definitely. He looked at me and said, that, listen, Paul, I do not have soldiers. All the soldiers are fighting. And the policemen are taking care of the national official buildings. I looked at him and told him in a brutal way, I'm sorry for that, and I beg pardon. I told him that, listen, sir, all of this, we see you and I. One day we come to an end. You and I will face history. If that day was today, are you sure that what you are telling me today is what you tell history? He was offended, of course. And then he left immediately. But I had an appointment with his boss 
as a diplomat for lunchtime. I went to meet his boss. When I was standing with General Bizimungu, I heard that the militia men had invaded Mikolin and they were already breaking doors. I told him that, listen, General, let us go down to the Mikolin. We came down to the Mikolin, and by the time we arrived, he told one of his bodyguards that, listen, Sergeant, tell, go up there and tell all the militia men who are in this hotel that whoever will kill anyone, I'm killing him. Whoever will beat anyone, I'm killing him. And whoever will remain in this hotel for the next five minutes, I will kill him. That time, militiamen had gathered refugees down around the swimming pool. The refugees kneeling down, hands up, ready to be slaughtered. And that day, General Bizimungu is the one who, so, who saved the lives of all of those people. Immediately, once again, the deciders sat together and came, with a, came up with a decision to evacuate the Mikolin refugees on that 17th in the evening. I told them that, listen, last time we tried to evacuate people. We could not succeed because it was too late in the night. Why don't we reinforce the security around the hotel so that these people will be evacuated tomorrow? They agreed with me, and they reinforced the security around the hotel. The United Nations brought in soldiers to come, five, five UN soldiers to come and stay in the hot, on the hotel compound for the first time. Because before, we had five gendarmes who were just staying around the hotel. The following morning, the whole day, the Mikolin refugees were evacuated, and I left in a UN jeep behind the last convoy. All on our way, the whole country was smelling death. All along the road, you could see dead bodies. We sat there in the ruins. We cried, just like small babies. That experience opened very wide my eyes, and I saw how devastating that country of mine had been. But I still had hope that things might change. I went back to Kigali, and when I arrived in Kigali, once again, we were start impunity never ended. Once again, we saw people breaking other people's doors, getting into their houses, staying there, and even now when we are gathered here, there are people who live in houses they never built and they never rent. Many people broke other people's shops and they got settled, just dumping to the other side of the counter and starting selling goods you never, sold, you never bought. And that, even now, is still there. Had we learned any lesson? I doubt very much. Very recently, I went to Darfur in the Sudan. When I arrived in the Sudan, I was very much touched to notice that what I was seeing in Rwanda between 1990 and 1994 is exactly what I saw in Darfur. In Rwanda, we had 1.5 million of displaced people within their own country. In Darfur, they had 2 million, more than 100,000 people had been killed, and nobody says, talks even about him. Ladies and gentlemen, men and women like Wallenberg are very few, but we need them. And among you, among you, all of you, you might be the Raoul Wallenberg, and you yet you do not know. Many of you have got a mission, and yet, you do not know it. Tonight, I urge you, each and everyone, to be a Wallenberg. And I have been honored to be made one. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.